inference for experiments. This applies both to confidence intervals and significance tests. The first part here says, what mistake do students often make when defining parameters in experiments, and how can you avoid it? So here's the mistake. Students, uh, not even knowing it, they refer to the sample data by mistake. And we know we're supposed to refer to the population, right? Population parameters refer to the population. So how do they do this? How do they refer to the sample data by mistake? Well, they speak in past tense. They say something like, the volunteers who showed side effects. So that automatically refers to the sample data. We don't want to do that. So how can you avoid it? Uh, just make sure you use present or future tense to generalize to the population when you're defining your parameters. And remember, that happens in the state step. So just avoid speaking in past tense. If you talk about the volunteers who've already shown side effects, that refers to the sample data. And we're not making inferences about the sample data. We're making inferences about the population. So example one is called Cash for Quitters. It says, in an effort to reduce health care costs, General Motors sponsored a study to help employees stop smoking. In the study, half of the subjects were randomly assigned to receive up to $750 for quitting smoking for a year, while the other half were simply encouraged to use traditional methods to stop smoking. So one group was offered a decent amount of money, and then one group was just simply encouraged to quit smoking using traditional methods. None of the 878 volunteers knew that there was a financial incentive when they signed up. At the end of one year, 15% of those in the financial rewards group had quit smoking, while only 5% in the traditional group had quit smoking. Do the results of this study give convincing evidence that a financial incentive helps people quit smoking compared to traditional methods? And this is from the Arizona Daily Star, February 11, 2009. Okay, so that convincing evidence piece is our cue to run a significance test. So let's go ahead and start with the state step. We're going to test two hypotheses, the null and the alternative. And the null would say there's no difference between the two groups. So we can say P1 minus P2 would be zero. And then the alternative would say one of them uh, is higher than the other. So P1 minus P2 is greater than zero. So hopefully it's obvious to you at this point which one of these has to be P1, right? Which group has to be P1, the bigger one. So um, we need to define what the parameters are. So where P1 and P2 are the true population proportions of smokers who would quit, not smokers who quit, right? We're not going to use past tense. We want to know about the population proportion of smokers who would quit because of either the money and the proportion of smokers who would quit using the traditional methods. So make sure to, to use either present tense or future tense to refer to the population proportion, right? Not just the sample or, or the experiment. We want to refer to the entire population proportion. We already know what percentage of smokers quit within the experiment. Oh, and don't forget, let's say what alpha level we're going to use. We'll just use the default here, alpha equal to 0 0.05. Okay, so I've got all three parts for the state step. I've got my hypotheses, define the parameter in context, got the alpha level. Now it's time for the plan step. And the first thing we want to do here is name the type of test that we're going to run. So we'll say if the conditions are met, we'll do a two-proportion z-test for the difference of P1 minus P2. So a two-proportion z-test, that's the name of our test. Okay, in the randomness condition, uh, it says in the problem the subjects were randomly assigned to the treatment groups. So 
So randomness is good. Um, how about for the independence condition? And here's an important point to make about experiments. We didn't sample people from the population, right? We just sampled volunteers. So the 10% condition doesn't apply to volunteers in an experiment, right? We weren't sampling um, from a finite population. Okay, so the 10% condition doesn't apply. It only applies when you're sampling from a finite population, which we didn't do that. We just had people sign up. We just had 878 volunteers that signed up. So that's an important point to note here. The 10% condition doesn't apply to experiments. So then how are we going to show or prove independence? Well, it's actually easier than you might think. You just have to say uh, smokers' decisions don't affect one another, so they're independent of each other. So we can assume smokers' decisions to quit are independent of each other. Right? We can't use the 10% condition because we weren't sampling from some population. So we're just going to say uh, we're going to assume smokers' decisions to quit are independent of each other. So that is unique to experiments as well, the independence condition. We don't use the 10% condition. And let's talk about normality. So as far as the proportions are concerned, we still need 10 successes and 10 failures from each group. So N1, P hat 1, 15% of 439. And where am I getting 439 from? Remember, there was 878 total volunteers, and then they were split between the two groups. So that is 66, which is at least 10. And then N1 times 1 minus P hat 1, so 439 times 0.85 now gives us 373, which is at least 10. And for the second group, the other 439 individuals, so we have 5% that quit. So 5% success rate gives us 22 people that actually quit, which is at least 10. And then how many failures in the second group? So 439 times 0.95, which is 417, which is at least 10. So we can say, because all of these are at least 10, the large counts condition is met. All right, time for the do step. Time to actually crunch some numbers and do some stats. And there's two things we need here. We need the test statistic, and we need the p-value. And to get the test statistic, which is a z-score, we're going to use the calculator, right? We're going to go with the two-prop z-test command. Two-proportion z-test command. So if you run the two-prop z-test command in your calculator, uh, if you do that correctly, that gives you a test statistic, our z-score of 4.94, and our p-value of a really, really, really small number, right? Looks like we've got six zeros and then three, eight, one. Okay, and let's use that p-value to make our decision in the conclude step. So we can say because our p-value, which is approximately 0, right, 0 0.00000381, that's approximately 0, which is definitely less than our alpha level of 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. So in context, that means we have convincing evidence Right? And I'm going to use the words from the problem here. We have convincing evidence that a financial incentive actually helps people quit smoking as compared to traditional methods. In other words, we support the alternative hypothesis because our p-value is so small. Okay, hopefully you're comfortable with the calculator by now. You have no problem running 
uh, the two prop Z test. Let me know if you have any issues with that. Just remember that for experiments, when you're defining those parameters at the beginning, uh, make sure you use present or future tense so we can talk about population parameters, right? We're going to generalize to the population. Don't use past tense because then you're automatically referring to the sample data. Just like in this example, I said smokers who would quit um, versus the smokers who quit. Also, don't forget that when we have an experiment where we just have a bunch of volunteers that signed up, we didn't randomly sample anybody from a population, so the 10% condition doesn't really apply uh, to experiments. So how do you meet independence? Well, we can just make a statement saying something about how smokers' decisions to quit are independent of each other, right? They have no influence on one another. All right, so those uh, inferences for experiments would also apply to confidence intervals as well. Uh, but that's enough for these notes, so I will see you in class.